Alright, um, I'm going to be reading Phantom by Susan Kay. Before I go on, I would like to say I'm not a trained professional uh, reader in any of this. And I'm only doing it because the book is hard to find and a lot of people want it and want to hear the story. Honestly, I suggest you buy the book first and read it before you hear it. So, uh, yeah. All rights belong to Susan Kay and uh, the publishing company, which I can't really make out. It's Lumnia Stars or something. I'm going in bits because it's a really big book and there aren't any chapters, so I'll be doing the best I can. Sorry if I mess up, by the way. Like I said, I'm not trained. Madeline, 1831 to 1840. It was a breach birth, and so, right up to the very last moment of innocent ignorance, I remained aware of the midwife's boisterous body encouragement. Just ahead now, my dear. Almost there. Your son is almost born. But now we must take great care do exactly what I say. Do you hear me, madam? Exactly. I nodded and drew a panting breath, clinging to the towel that had been hung on the wooden bedstead behind my bed. The candlelight threw huge shadows up to the ceiling, strange, alluring shapes that were oddly threatening to me in the mindless delirium of pain. In that last lonely moment, threshing anguish, it seemed to me that there was no one left alive in the world but me. That I would be shut up for all eternity in this bleak prison of pain. There was a great bursting, tearing sensation, and then peace, silence, the breathless hush of stunned belief. I opened my eyes to see the midwife's face, rosy with exhaustion, only moments before a silver draining of color, and my housemaid. Simonette, backing away from the bed, with one hand pressed against her mouth. I remember thinking, it must be dead. But sensing even in that confused split second before I knew the truth, that it was worse than that. Uh, much worse. Struggling to sit up against the damp pillow, I looked down at the bloody sheets beneath me and saw what they had seen. I did not scream. None of us screamed. Not even when we saw it make a feeble movement and we realized that it wasn't dead. The sight of the thing that lay upon the sheet was so unbelievable that it denied all power of movement to the vocal cords. We only stared, the three of us, as though we expected our combined dumbstruck horror to melt this harrowing abomination back into the realm of nightmare where it surely belonged. The midwife was the first to recover from the paralysis, swooping forward to cut the cord with a hand that shook so badly she could hardly hold the scissors. God have mercy, she muttered, crossing herself instinctively. Christ have mercy. I watched with numb, detached calm as she rolled the creature in a shawl and dropped it into the cradle that lay beside the bed. Run and fetch father, monsieur, said she told Simonette in a trembling voice. Tell him he had better come here at once. Simonette wrenched open the door and fled down the unlit staircase without a backward glance to, at me. She was the last servant to live under my roof. I never saw her again after that terrible night, but she never came back even to collect her belongings from the attic bedroom. When Father Monsot came, he came alone. The midwife was waiting for him at the door. She had done all that her duty required of her, and now she was impatient to be gone and forget the part she had played in this bad dream. Impatient enough, I observed detachedly, to have overlooked the matter of payment. Where's the girl? she demanded, with immediate displeasure. The maid, father, is she not with you? Father Minsoot shook his head, graying head. The little mademoiselle refused to accompany me here. She was quite out of her senses with fright, and I could not persuade her otherwise. Well, that doesn't surprise me, said the midwife darkly. Did she tell you that the child is a monster? In all my years I have never known anything like this, and I've seen some sights, as you well know, father. But it doesn't look very strong. I suppose that's a mercy. I listened incredulously. They were talking as though I wouldn't there, as though this dreadful thing had rendered me some kind of deaf and mindless idiot, 
who had forfeited all right to human dignity. Like the creature in the cradle, I had become an object of horrified discussion. I was no longer a person. The Mima shrugged herself into her shawl and picked up a basket. I dare say it'll die. They usually do, thank God. And it's not made to cry. It's always good, hopeful son. No doubt it'll be gone by morning. But at any rate, it's none of my business now. I've done my part. If you excuse me, father, I must be getting along. I promised to look in on another confinement. Madame the Scot, the third, you know. The midwife's voice trailed away as she disappeared out into the darkness on the landing. Father Miss Sod closed the door behind her, put his lantern down on the chest of drawers, and laid his wet cloak across a chair to dry. He had a comfortable, well-lived-in face, tanned and leathery from walking in all weathers. I suppose he must have been about fifty. I knew that he had seen many terrible things in the course of his long ministry. Nevertheless, I saw him recoil in voluntary shock when he looked into the cradle. One hand tightened on the crucifix around his neck, while the other hastily made the sign of the cross. He knelt in prayer for a moment before coming to stand by the side of my bed. My dear child, he said compassionately. Do not be deceived into believing that the Lord has abandoned you. Such tragedies as this are beyond all mortal understanding. But I ask you to remember God does not create without a purpose. I shivered. It's still alive, isn't it? He nodded, biting his full under lip and glancing sadly at the cradle. Father, I hesitated fearfully, trying to summon the courage to continue. If I don't touch it, if I don't feed it, he shook his head grimly. The position of the church is quite clear on such issues, Madeleine. What are you suggesting is murder? But surely in this case it would be a kindness. It would be a sin, he said severely. A mortal sin. I urge you to put all thoughts of such wickedness from your mind. It is your duty to succor a human soul. You must nourish and care for this child as you would any other. I turned my head away on the pillow. I wanted to say that even God could make mistakes, but even in the depths of my despair, I could not quite find the courage to voice such blasphemy. How could this horrible abomination be human? It was as alien to me as a reptile, ugly, repulsive, and unwanted. What right had any priest to insist that it should live? Is this God's mercy? God's infinite wisdom? Tears of exhaustion and outraged misery began to steal down my taut face as I stared at the stripped wallpaper before my eyes. For three months I had struggled through an unending maze of tragedy, following the one cradle that burned steadily just beyond my reach and beckoned me on. The small flickering light of hope contained in that promise of new life. Now that the candle had been extinguished, there was only darkness. Darkness in the bottomless, smooth-sided abyss of the deepest pit in hell. For the first time in my life I was alone. No one was going to shield me from this burden. I think it would be wise if I baptized this child at once, said Father Minster grimly. Perhaps you would like to give me a name? I watched a priest move slowly around the room, a tall shadow in his black habit, collecting my porcelain wash basin and blessing the water within. I have meant to call his son Charles, after my dead husband, but that was impossible now. The very idea was quite obscene. Name. I must decide upon a name. A sense of unreality had descended upon me once more a numb, unthinking stupor that seemed to paralyze my brain. I could think of nothing, and at last in despair I told the priest to name the child after himself. He looked at me for a long moment, but he made no comment, no protest, as he reached down into the cradle. I baptize thee, Eric, he said slowly. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. 
and he leaned forward and placed a muffled bundle in my arms with the determination I dared not fight. This is your son, he said simply. Learn to love him as God does. Collecting his lantern and his cloak, he turned to leave me, and presently I heard the old stairs creaking beneath his heavy tread. The front door closing behind him. I was alone with the monster that Charles and I had created out of love. Neither in my life had I experienced such fear, such utter misery, as I did in that first moment when I held my son in my arms. I realized that this creature, this thing, was totally dependent on me. If I left it to serve or freeze to death, it was my soul that would burn for all eternity. I was a practicing Catholic, and I believed only too seriously in the existence of hell's flames. Fearfully, with a trembling hand, I parted the shawl that covered the child's face. I had seen deformities before. Who <laughs> was not? But nothing like this. The entire skull was exposed beneath a thin, transparent membrane, grotesquely littered, littered with little blue pulsing veins. Sunken, mismatched eyes and grossly malformed lips. A horrible, gaping hole where the nose should have been. My body, like some imperfectly working potter's wheel, had thrown out the pitiable creature. He looked like something that had been dead a long time. All I wanted to do was bury him and run. Dimly, through my revelation and terror, I became aware that he was watching me. The missailed eyes, fixed intently and wanderingly upon mine, were curiously scented and seemed to study me with pity, almost as though he knew and understood my horror. I had never seen such awareness, such powerful consciousness, in the eyes of any newborn child, and I had found myself returning his stare, grimly fascinated, like a victim memorized by his rattlesnake. And then he cried. I have no words to describe the first sound of his voice and the extraordinary response it evoked in me. I had always considered the cry of the newborn to be utterly sexless, piercing, irritating, curiously unattractive. But his voice was a strange music that brought tears rushing to my eyes, softly seducing my body so that my breast ached with a primitive and overwhelming urge to hold him close. I was powerless to resist his instinctive plea for survival. But the moment his flesh touched mine, and there was silence, the spell was broken. Panic and revolution seized me. I dashed him from my breast as though he were some disgusting insect sucking my blood. I flung him down without caring where he fell, and escaped to the farthest corner of the room. And there, I had cowered like a hunted animal. With my chin pressed tightly against my knees and my arms wrapped around my head, I wanted to die. I wanted us both to die. If he had cried again in that moment, I know I would have killed him. First him, and then myself. But he was silent. Perhaps he was already dead. Deeper and deeper into the shelter of my own body, I huddled, rocking to and fro like some poor, unhinged creature in an asylum, burying away from a burden I could not face. Life had been so beautiful until this last summer. Too easy too full of pleasure. Nothing in its brief, custed, leth, length, and prepared me for the tragedies that had rained relentlessly upon me since my marriage to Charles. Nothing had prepared me for Eric. The only child of elderly, doting parents, I had been a little princess, center of every stage on which I performed. My father was an architect in Rome, a successful but eminently whimsical man who loved music and was delighted by the aptitude I showed for the art. From an early age, I was regularly trotted out in company to display my voice and my moderate skills on the violin and piano, and through Mama, sent me to the Ursuline convent in Rowan for the sake of my soul. Papa's sights were set on more worldly ends. Singing lessons were arranged to the disgust of the nuns, who considered a girl's voice to be a source of vanity and affection, and every week I escaped the professor who had 
told to prepare me for the stage of the Parisian Opera House. My voice was good, but I never discovered whether I had the talent of self-discipline to conquer Paris. When I was seventeen, I accompanied my father to a site meeting with a client in the Rue de l'Ecat, and it was there that I met Charles and simultaneously abandoned all thought of a glorious career on the stage. Fifteen years older than myself, Charles was a master mason whose, my, whose work my father sincerely admired. Papa always says it was a privilege to place plans in the hands of a man who had such a deep, instinctive feel for the artistry of building and perfectionist who was never satisfied with second best. Between Charles and my father, the average client with an eye to economy had a hard time of it. Perhaps it was because they were so totally in accord professionally that it seemed natural for Papa to welcome Charles into family once I had made my preference clear. Perhaps he remembered himself as a strongly young architect with no commissions, who had been obliged to fight Mama's family all those years ago. Perhaps he was simply determined, as he had been throughout my coasted existence, that nothing should mar the happiness of his only child. If he was disappointed at my decision to throw away a promising future as a prima donna, he said nothing. As for Mama, she was English, with all the characteristics that the, the word implies. I think she would rather have seen me respectively if rather ingloriously married than on any Parisian stage. Charles and I went to London for the honeymoon, at Papa's expense armed with a list of architectural sites that must be seen. We didn't see much. It was November, the most dismal of all English months, and for most of our three weeks' stay the city was shrouded in thick yellow fog. It was a good excuse to stay inside, exploring the wonders of God's architecture in our neat, discreet hotel bedroom in Kingston. On the last day of our visit, the sun streamed mercilessly through a chink in the heavy curtains and lured us guiltfully from the sheets. We couldn't go home without seeing Hampton Court. Papa would never forgive us. It was early evening when the Lendo deposited us outside the hotel steps. While Charles struggled with an unfamiliar coinage and unhelpful car driver, I went into the foyer to collect our key. A letter for you, madame, said the bellboy. And I took the envelope absently, tucking it into my muff as I turned to watch Charles enter the foyer. I still caught my breath at the sight of him. Just I had that first day in Rowan. He was so tall and so unashamedly good looking, and when he saw the key in my hand, his smile mirrored my thought. We ran up the wide, richly carpeted staircase, laughing and bumping heedlessly into two elderly ladies, who were descending with all due English dignity. French, I heard Brumpton say disdainfully. What else can you expect? Charles and I only laughed even louder. Charles said, we should pity the English, really. They were all as stiff and cold as Gothic gargoyles. None of them knew what love meant. Two hours later, as I lay in Charles' arms like a contented, lazy cat, I suddenly remembered the letter in my mouth. It was only after our hasty return to France that I came to realize I had conceived my first child in the same week that both my parents died of cholera. There was no general epidemic. An old acquaintance of my father's visiting from Paris was taken ill in the course of a convivial evening at my parents' house. Papa would not hear of a friend returning home to be nursed by servants, and that natural, generous hospitality of his skill of his killed the entire household. I could not settle in Rowan after the tragedy. The city had become for me a vast architectural museum a mausoleum de dedicated to my spoiled and happy childhood, the Baroque chapel of the old Jesuit College, the place Saint-Vivien, 
the elegant Rue Street. Petrice, with its splendid 17th and 18th century houses hidden behind heavy ports. Cohiels. No. I could not continue to live in a city where every street corner and every fine old building evoked a memory that gave me pain. It was a month before Charles would permit me to enter my father's house for fear of contagion. Contagion. We were by then quite certain that I was pregnant, and Charles was fiercely and absurdly protective, determined that nothing should place his precious wife and child at risk. He was behaving as though I was his first woman in the world to have a child, and his over-anxious caution made me cautious, curious, slightly amused, and just a little afraid that if it was a girl, I should be jealous. You shouldn't be so anxious, Charles. Women have children all the time. I just want you to take care, he said solemnly. I don't want anything to go wrong. I put a hand on his sleeve. Ali disturbed by his intensity, my father's death had evidently affected him far more deeply than I had thought, and I was ashamed of that. In the selfishness of my own distress, I had failed to realize how he too was mourning the loss of a good friend. This Baby is very important to you, isn't it? I said slowly. Anyone would think you were afraid we won't have any more. He laughed and drew me into the shelter of his arm. Of course we'll have more. But there's something very special about the firstborn. Don't you feel that, Madeline? Greeting for the first time in your own marriage, it makes me feel like God. <laughs> oh, you, I said affectionately. You are an artist. Papa always said you should have been a sculptor as well as a master mason. I thought of it, he admitted, quite seriously, in fact, as a boy. What stopped you? I demanded curiously. The idea of dying in poverty, he grinned. Now, be a good girl and come to bed. It's late, and my son must have his rest. While Charles slept, I lay awake seeing the picture that he had painted for me of this very special child. I imagined the sign of the cross made with holy water on the smooth, rounded forehead of a flawless baby. First fashioning of our great love. Charles had promised me perfection, and I believed in his vision without question. I had no doubts none of the normal anxieties that beset an expectant mother. In the magic circle of our love, our happiness seemed safe and assured, protected by foundations that could never be shaken by misfortune. Everything came to me, of course. The lovely old 17th century house in the Rue St. Patrice, and the income from my father's many sensible investments. You are a woman of independent means, Charles told me pensively, and I sensed his vague unease. He didn't want anyone saying he had only married me for my money. For the first time, I became aware of the inner conflicts any man faces when he marries above his station. When he marries above his station, and I began to be increasingly convinced that we should leave Rouen and start a fest elsewhere. I went through Papa's house, systematically anonymizing those sentimental relics of my childhood, which I knew I could not bear to part. Mama's jewelry. Papa's architectural library and files. Small violin in which I had screeched my first ungodly notes. And all the time, stilted letters on condolence continued to arrive, expressing regret and respect in the appropriate proportions. Then one morning I opened a letter from Marie. Marie Pivot, companion of my tedious captivity in the convent, had been my bridal attendant, possibly the plainest bridesmaid that ever was. Even Mama had raised an eyebrow at my choice. I suppose Marie had always been an unlikely friend for me. Even in the convent, I had had my following, my own peculiar set, who hung upon my every word and copied my hairstyle, and the subtle, title, and the subtle little touches I added to my dresses. And certainly in looks, 
Marie had nothing to recommend her, so it was excessively plain. We faced and pinched beneath a shock of unfashionable carrot-colored hair, and she had about her that air of timidity which automatically attracts every bully in the vicinity. She must have been about ten when I first took her under the mantle of my protection. The rest of my friends found her boring, and had I given the signal, they would gladly have made her life a misery with the age-old ritual of schoolyard torment. But I did not give it. I allowed Marie to trot after me, like some faithful spaniel, and told the others that I found her useful, which was true enough, and yet not the whole truth. I was the prettiest girl in the convent, and the most influential by far. My word was law. And Marie remained my friend long after the rest had drifted away to the homes scattered throughout Normandy and ceased to write. The letter I opened now was entirely Marie, full of clumsy gaffes and muddled sentiments that were written straight from the heart, but probably better left unsaid. She begged us to come and stay with her family in St. Martin de Boucherville, and as I pushed the letter across the table to Charles, I heard him groan. I gave him a look, and he subsided into silence. We went down to Boucherville at the end of the week. Charles survived two days of overpowering parole hospitality before deciding that a contract required his urgent presence in Rouen. And the same afternoon that he left, Marie and I discovered that the isolated stone-walled house on the edge of the village was for sale, covered with ivy, sprawling, inconvenient to run, its gardens and orchard entirely neglected by a previous elderly occupant. I fell in love with it on the spot. It's too far from Rouen, said Charles in horror when he returned. It's beautiful, I murmured. It needs a lot of work. I don't care. Oh, Charles, I want that house so much. It's so, so romantic. He sighed, and I noticed the sun picking out the silver threads that were just beginning to sprinkle his jet black hair. Oh, well, he said, with his familiar air of resigned indulgence. If it's romantic, then I suppose we shall simply have to take it. And so, we came to the sleepy village of Boucherville. By May, the old house had been completely redecorated and furnished in the latest Parisian style. It was a perfect little palace, awaiting the arrival of my perfect little prince. The 3rd of May, 1831, is a day I will never forget. It was hot and seasonably hot for early May, and I lay on the sofa like a beached whale, fanning myself and demanding drinks of lemonade from the housemaid. I was tired and peevish. My two-year-old spaniel, spaniel, Sasha, bounded tirelessly around the drawing room, dropping her ball repeatedly at the side of my couch and wagging her tail hopefully. It's too hot to go out in the garden, I grumbled. We'll just have to wait until Marie comes. Oh, Sasha, do go away. Simonette! Simonette! Simonette appeared in the doorway, adjusting her apron hastily. Yes, madam? Take this silly dog outside and don't let her in again until Mademoiselle Prevot comes to take her for a walk. Yes, madam. In the romping chase that ensued, my new table lamp was knocked to the floor, smashing the white glass shade and spilling colosa oil on the carpet. My shriek of fury drove both dog and maid from the room. I was on my hands and knees mopping clumsily and ineffectually at the mess when Marie arrived. It's ruined, I sobbed angrily. My lovely new carpet, it's spoiled. No, it's not said Marie in her maddingly reasonable fashion. It's only one patch, really. If we put this rug over it, no one will ever know it's there. I don't want a rug there, I said childishly. It throws the entire room out of balance. I shall have to have a new carpet. She sat back on her heels and playing 
Muslund groaned and regarded me thoughtfully. That's not necessary, you know, Madeline. If I were you, I'd leave it as is. No one wants to live in a house that's perfect all their lives. Least of all, a small child. I glared at her. I was about to tell her that my child would never dream of romping around my lovely house spilling things on my best carpet. When the baby kicked me with my heart with such violence that I gave a gasp of shock. Nobody asked for your opinion, you little beast, I muttered half angry, half amused by the startling reminder of his unseen presence. But Marie did not smile, as I had expected her to. Instead, she turned away and looked intensely uncomfortable. I don't think you should say a thing like that, Madeline. Mama says it's terribly unlucky to speak against the newborn. Oh, don't be such a goose, I scoffed. It can't hear me. No, she said uneasily, but God can. I laughed at her, all my good humor suddenly restored by her superstitious absurdity. God has better things to do than eavesdrop on the faithful, I asserted confidently. Think of all the really wicked people in the world, all the murderers and the harlots and the heathens. The conversation drifted to other matters, and by the time Marie left, I had quite forgotten my anger. Charles wouldn't mind if I had any carpet. And if you want, darling, he would say if I asked. Whatever makes you happy. And gross and uncomfortable as I was, I could probably contrive to struggle into Rowan once more before the birth. It was growing cooler now. Fresh wind blowing through the open casements. Sasha was permitted back into the room and worn out with her walk fell asleep in what was left on my lap. I watched her head vibrating steadily to the rhythm of the baby's vigorous kicks. He was restless tonight. I reflected indulgently. We always spoke of the coming baby as he. Charles had suspected my wedding ring over my abdomen on a piece of cotton thread and insisted I was carrying a boy. I knew now much he wanted a son son to follow him as a master craftsman. Through the half-open door, I listened drowsily to the sounds of Semina preparing supper. I knew that Charles would be late home. He had accepted a lucrative contract for a huge mansion on the outskirts of Rohan, and his men were taking advantage of the light every evening. I did not expect him home before dusk. The whole bracket clock was a striking six, the sun still streaming through the windows and making a latticework pattern on the carpet I intended to change, when they carried him home on a makeshift stretcher. There had been an accident on the building site, a piece of falling masonry. They assured me that it was no one's fault, that no one was to blame, as though they expected that to be some sort of comfort. The doctor came and shortly after the priest. Suddenly my house was full of people murmuring platitudes about the child, the child that would have to comfort me in my old timely bereavement. On the evening of the day we buried Charles, I lay alone in her bed, her magnificent new bed that had been a wedding gift for my parents, and felt the new life throbbing beneath the swollen drum of my stomach. He remembered that I prayed for his son. A son to remind me of Charles. Well, now I have him. Hours had passed since his birth. Gradually, I became aware of a new day dawning outside the uncovered window. And with the light, I heard again the first plump of notes of that siren cry which wrapped itself around my brain like a lover's caress. I pressed my hands against my ears, but I could not shut it out. And I knew that even if I ran to the furthest corner of the world, I could not escape from him. That sound would still be there in my head, driving me mad with grief. With very resignation, I went back to the bed and covered the hideous little face with a handkerchief. When I could no longer see him, I found I could control my revolution sufficiently to handle him. Dragging myself downstairs, I found a little milk in the kitchen and warmed it. Later, 
while he slept in a room full of summer sunlight, I sat in the chair feverishly fashioning the first garment he ever wore, a mask. Looking back, I don't know how I would have managed without Marie, my father myself, for I quickly learned what a slender and ethereal thing popularity is. My stratagem in a village evaporated overnight. No one came near my house. It was as though they had painted a red cross on my door, as they used to do in the old days to warn passers-by that those within were contaminated with the plague. Even in this bright new century, where science makes new leaps with every year that passes, superstitious fears still rule most small rural communities, like Boisjeville. Here say tales are, are inclined to grow out of all proportion, but in this case, imagination and malice would have been hard to put in broider the lurid truth. When I finally ventured out into the village, I found myself shunned like a leper. People walked the other way. When they saw me approaching, and when I had passed by, I would be deeply aware of the nudging and cold gossip that was taking place in my wake. Father Mansoul warned me not to take the child out in public. I thought, he, and though he did not say so, I knew it was because he feared for our safety. Marie came most days, in spite of the displeasure of her parents and the censure of the village. She overcame her own horror and timidity for my sake and taught me the true meaning of friendship. I was now entirely dependent upon her for companionship and comfort. The expensive candle, cradle, lay forlornly in the attic bedroom, whence I had quickly banished it, and for most of the time it was mercifully silent. He never cried unless he was hungry, and that, thank God, it wasn't very often. It was as though some deep-rooted sense of self-preservation prevented him from seeking any other form of comfort. I suppose my distaste at handling him must have communicated itself to him from his earliest days, and indeed, he gave me so little trouble in those first months that I was able to shut him out of my mind for hours at a time, and never went near him unless I was forced to. I never smiled at him or played with him. I assumed he would be an idiot. It was Marie who hung a string of little bells across the cradle, out of pity. And one morning she drew me upstairs against my will, and made me listen to stand outside the open door. Listen, she said. I hear the familiar random tinkling of the bells, the lonely sound of a solitary, neglected baby amusing itself which I heard so many times before, and from which I now turned into guilty haste. I'm baking, I complained uneasily. The cake will burn. Let it, she said rather shortly. I want you to hear something. Listen. Surprised by her tone, I did as she asked, and as I listened, I became aware that the bells were not being struck at random, but deliberately, in a repetitive pattern, we formed a short phase. It had to be a coincidence, a freak chance. But even as I told myself this, the phase shifted, altered, and settled itself into a new pattern, which was repeated without variation several times. This is no ordinary child, said Marie, quietly. How much longer do you think you can continue to shut him away up here, trying to pretend he doesn't exist? I turned and fled downstairs, slamming the kitchen door shut on the sound of the bells which had seemed to follow me. I had not allowed myself to think beyond the possibility of caring for some mindless animal. My child was as hideous, monster, and somehow the thought that he might be exceptional in any other way only filled me with terror. If Maria was right, I knew my, predic my predicament was going to grow worse. It was not going to be possible to ignore the mind that was developing rapidly behind the little white kid mask. One evening, roughly six months after his birth, there was a terrible storm. The wind rattled the glass in the casements and howled down the chimney, 
making the fire flicker and smoke. Rain pelted madly on the roof. Thunder rolled directly overhead, and each flash of lightning lit the entire room for a split second. I hated to be alone in the storm. I looked for Sasha, who was also terrified of thunder and should, by rights, have been cowering under my skirts by now. But she wasn't there. The door into the hall was ajar, and I assumed she had gone upstairs to hide under the bed. Suddenly I heard a great crash from the attic bedroom, the sound of something heavy falling to the floor, and I ran up the staircase in alarm. From the doorway of Eric's room, I could see the empty cradle lying on its side. And in the center of the room, some distance away, the big spaniel apparently wearing a small white bundle. Stop it, Sasha, I screamed. Leave it alone. Sasha! Sasha! To my astonished relief, the dog trotted obediently to my side and sat down, waving her plumed tail back and forth across the bare floorboards. I hardly dared to look at the little bundle. If she had taken him for a rat, I could hardly blame her. As I steeled myself to go and pick him up, I realized with a shock that there was no need. He was coming to me. I began to back away instinctively onto the landing, but I was unable to take my eyes off the painful, stubborn, shuffling movement with which he was dragging himself across the room, and then, with equal horror, I realized that he was not making for me, but for the dog. Shasha was watching him rarely, her head on one side, her ears pricked with curiosity. When he laid hold of one paw with his stick-like fingers, she growled deep in her throat, but she did not bare her teeth. I found that I was rooted to the spot, unable to make a move to prevent this from happening. I watched, with frozen fascination, as he pulled himself up into a sitting position, using the animal's fur for leverage, and then stretched out one hand to grope uncertainly toward her face. Sasha, he said very slowly and distinctly, Sasha. I took hold of the banister for support. I had to be dreaming this. Sasha? Sasha? Sasha! He repeated steadily. The dog pushed her nose down into a little masked face, and I heard the dull thud of his head striking the bare floor when he overbalanced. I cried out sharply, but I was still unable to move. I watched the dog paw him gently, and then, for the first time, I heard him laugh. Three months later, he was walking and mimicking my words like a wretched minor bird. It was impossible to ignore his presence now. His voice and his interfering hands seemed to be everywhere, and the only respite I knew was in those few hours when he climbed into Sasha's basket and slept curled up beside her. He called me Mama, God knows why, I certainly didn't teach him to. But I'm very much afraid that in those early days he believed the dog was his mother. She seemed to have taken a liking to him, treating him with the sort of rough affection she might have shown a large puppy. Marie told me I should not allow it. She said it wasn't right, that I was raising him to think he was an animal. It keeps him quiet for a few hours, I retorted rarely. If you think you can do any better, you take him home to your mother. That was the end of the conversation. I tried very hard to be reconciled to the situation, for though I could not express any physical affection, I was determined to have the satisfaction of educating him. His abnormally accel accelerated development showed no sign of slowing down. By the age of four, he was reading the Bible with beautiful clarity and mastering exercises on the violin and piano that I had not attempted before my eighth year. He climbs like a monkey, and there was nothing I could place beyond the reach of his determined hands. He repeatedly dismantled my clocks and threw the most appalling tantrums at his inability to put them back together. He could not bear to be defeated by inanimate objects. Soon I began to be a little frightened of his awesome progress. I had been uncommonly well-educated for a girl, 
Papa himself had taught me sufficient geometry to comprehend the science on which all architecture is based. But I was beginning to see that Eric would soon be quite beyond me. The figures fascinated him. And from the basic principles I taught him, he fashioned calculations that I could not follow. However patiently he explained them to me, he had discovered my father's architectural library and spent many hours poring over the sketches of Laguerre and the Abbe Cordemore, Blondel and Durand. And he knew endlessly, obsessively, on any surface that was available. If I did not keep him continually supplied with paper, I would find his designs on the flyleaf of my father's books, on the reverse side of his plans even on the wallpaper up the side of the stairs. When a pair of needlework scissors disappeared from my work basket, I thought nothing of it until I found an intricate castle lovingly engraved into the polished mahogany surface of my dining room table. Those scissors did an incredible amount of, this ta of tasteful wreckage. And though I had turned the house upside down and beat him mercilessly in my fury, I was never able to discover where he hid them. But there were mysterious and inexplainable voids. He seemed incapable of distinguishing right from wrong. And though he could draw like a seasoned artist, he could not, or would not, write. If I put a pen into his hand and told him to copy out a Hail Mary, he became instantly clumsy, as dull and stupid over the simple task as the most backward of children. I could not beat him into submission, though I am ashamed to admit that I often attempted to do so. He had a will of, his, of iron, which I could not bend, and a spectacular temper, which frequently reduced me to violence. Exhaustion and fear of doing him a serious injury made me reserve calligraphy as a penance from which he might be released for good behavior. Music was the keystone of his extraordinary genius. Music welled up from some bottomless pool within him and flowed like a ceaseless fountain through his fingertips, making an instrument of virtually every object that fell into his inventive hands. He could not sit at the table without unconsciously beating time with his heels against the back of his chair or tapping out a rhythm on his plate with a knife. A slap would check him momentarily, but within a minute his eyes would glaze over as he slipped back into the secret inner world of sound. In the early days, when I sang old operatic arias to pass hours of solitude, he would leave whatever he was doing and come to sit by the piano in wandering silence. Shortly before he was five, I allowed him to take over the accompaniment for me, and if I failed to master a difficult tonality, he would stop playing. To point out the offending note, which seemed perfectly pitched with the intimidating and dizzying purity of his faultless top register. Already he was beginning to make Mozart look like a dull plotter by comparison. But all the time that he sat composing haunting refrains or playing the piano with a dexterity far beyond his years, I knew that his incredibly fertile mind was plotting fresh, awesome mischief beyond my imagination. 